I'd been in the borderlands for 15 years before the first wall went up. And since then, there have been dramatic changes that have really just been heartbreaking for people who knew the borderlands. Our boundaries are everywhere and we don't really think about what they do to all of the other creatures that share this planet with us. When people see my images, the reaction almost every time has been just, I didn't have any idea that this place was so beautiful or that these creatures live there. And surprisingly, many, many people had no idea we were building a border wall on our southern border. I think people create boundaries because it helps us deal with what otherwise we would perceive as chaos, either at a small scale like our own backyard or at a large scale at national boundaries. I think some of the, the barriers that we create, we create out of fear. The Department of Homeland Security started building the border wall in 2007 and the mandate was for 700 miles of border wall along a 2,000 mile border. The Real ID Act allowed the Department of Homeland Security to waive all laws in order to expedite building of a border wall and that includes the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Wilderness Act. All of these laws that are essentially meant to protect us from ourselves. And what we realized as ecologists is that there's been a lot of talk about security and border fence issues, but nobody really had any data on some of the key species down there. What really makes the uh, U.S.-Mexico border region special is it's kind of a meeting location for both North America and Central and South America species. And so it has one of the highest biodiversity uh, levels that we find anywhere in the U.S. Five of North America's six cat species live in the borderlands. And three of those cats are endangered, the jaguar, the ocelot, and the jaguarundi. And the, really their main hope for being restored in the United States is to have open migration corridors with Mexico. Any human-made structure out on the landscape has a high potential to impact a wildlife, particularly uh, migratory species that need to move throughout the year to gain either access to food resources or water resources. One of the things we see with uh, man-made boundaries such as the U.S.-Mexico border is they can appear very quickly on the landscape. There's a tendency sometimes to say, well, the animals will just adjust and they'll adapt and move in a different way. But a lot of animals just haven't had the time to adapt and change with such a major change on the landscape. I've seen wildlife trying to cross the border and not being able to. At one point, I saw a pair of javelina traveling along the border for about 100 yards, and they would go up to the wall and they would smell it, and then they would continue walking, um, and then go up to it and smell it, continue walking, and eventually they turned away. And that, of course, is a problem for those javelina, but it's also a problem from an ecological standpoint because Javelina are seed distributors. If they can't move north, then neither can the plants whose seeds they distribute. So a whole ecosystem disruption can come from, from this barrier. I think early on in the discussion of the border wall uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border, there was an acknowledgement that there was going to be impacts to wildlife. As an ecologist, the first thing that jumps in my mind is there's got to be some way we can mitigate this. We are now starting to generate data as the conservation community of the potential impacts of the wall on a movement of wildlife. And our hope as conservationists is that the people that are on the ground and the decision makers 
will take that information and make adjustments. One of the really good pieces of advice that I got early on in my career was in order to think like a scientist and to, to be a good scientist, we need to put ourselves in the place of the animals. And by that I mean, you know, really going out there and thinking like that animal would on the landscape. And so that kind of uh, approach transcends just the science of being a wildlife ecologist. It always helps to take a different perspective than your own. Probably there will always be boundaries that humans impose on the rest of the world, but the question is, do we do it thoughtfully, consciously, um, and find ways to, to minimize the damage that we do, um, or do we do it without thought and, and create all sorts of un, unintended consequences? I have a lot of hope that we're going to get to a place where we understand uh, the impacts that we've had on the land and on wild species and try to come back into balance and I think we'll get there.